I was going to say the same thing about your shirt. I love the pineapple. It's a pineapple. Pineapple fan. It's a pineapple day. It is. Yes, it is. I don't know what that is, but I don't either. I'll take it. Good to see y'all this morning. (laughs) Oh my goodness, I I don't know about that banter sometimes. Anyway, that's all right. Hey, I just want to say welcome. Good to see y'all this morning. I see very, very familiar faces, so I I don't need the whole rundown. You guys know where the coffee's at. (laughs) Make sure you've got your program and your Connect card. You want to make sure that you fill that out. You know, there is so much happening, and a couple of things that I just want to point out. Yesterday was Feed the Need. Feed the Need uh, went very well. In fact, we've got one of the trucks here. One is still over in Portage, but... um, uh, collected tons of food um, that we from town and country markets, and it was just a blessing to be out there and to enjoy it. 
it's always so cool just to see the generosity of people. And I think what really struck me yesterday was the children. So many times people come in and they're like, yeah, 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 you know, whatever. They just want to get through the door, you know, and you hand them the flyer and they come out and the kids are carrying the bags. Mom, mom, you said we could give. We, mom, mom, you said you, we could give this little, you know, it's a bag of tuna or it's macaroni and cheese or whatever it is that they're sharing. You know, and a little child to lead them. It's just wonderful how they did, how they just are so generous. They want to help, and they're just beaming and so happy that they've been able to do something. And this little girl, she was like holding on her to her box of cereal. She's like, "Mom, this is my favorite cereal," and she gave it to the to the box. She was just like, she says, she says, "But mom, it's my favorite." And she goes, "That's okay, honey. Somebody else can have breakfast because of you." And it's just such a blessing for them to experience that at such a young age. So it was just really blessing, and I just want to um, point out that if you are, did not get the opportunity to help yesterday, or if you'd like to, this afternoon we're actually taking things over to the Northwest Indiana Food Bank and sorting and packing them into boxes for them. That's part of the ministry that we do, and we can use some volunteers if anybody would like to help. Particularly, they also may need an extra driver or two, uh, depending on how many people offer. Uh, to facilitate this fun, um, Tracy has prepared lunch, um, so there will be lunch for anybody who who decides to stay and help out we'll be leaving here at 1 30 and we'll be back by 5 30 but we're all like caravanning over there together and enjoy the time um the only thing we ask the kids have to be 10 years or older if they're helping um and uh it's best if you have closed toed shoes especially not flip-flops the floor is a little uneven um, and we move at a pretty fast pace while we're over there so if you'd uh, have something or have nothing planned this afternoon or you're just ready to jump in and serve it's a great opportunity and we have a wonderful time doing that so see tracy for details if you would like to join in with us this afternoon or to show up after second service and come and have lunch and join the fun um operation christmas child things are going on we're still collecting small toys and um, a reminder that shoebox bunko tickets are available um, Teresa, Sharon Quackenbush. Let's see, who's here? Kathy Mann. Oh, there you are. Deanna is here. This service. So if you're still if you're looking for tickets, make sure that you see one of the girls um, and they will get you connected. Again, that's the fundraiser we're doing to raise money to for postage to send the boxes to the children. Um, and that is coming up here in June twenty seventh. Is that right? Yep, 27th. So make sure that uh, make sure you see one of them to get that. If you did not attend the Bad Box class this Tuesday and you would still like to, that's okay. This was our first week of introduction, and I understand that will be posted on the web if you missed it. But um, we're jumping in and continuing that study this coming week, so Tuesdays. I just would encourage you, again, a good practical exercise in walking in the Spirit day by day, moment by moment. I just would encourage you to come and join us for that class on Tuesdays. All ages are welcome. Um, the toolbox team are still working hard at things. They've done great things in the basement. If you haven't been down there, they've done great things all over the building. Um, but uh, they are working on installing ceiling tiles and still looking for some help on Monday evenings. If you have availability then, they are working from 4 to 8. And um, on the back, some upcoming things like the fair. Who knew the fair was coming? I did. <laughs> What a wonderful thing. We're going to be doing the service at the fair again this year and um, a, sing, a sing type of service in the afternoon. Yes, a Sunday afternoon sing. Yep. Yeah, so um, a great opportunity for you to plan that day as your day at the fair. Again, because we come before 10 o'clock in the morning, there's no admission. You're getting into the fair free, plus you get to enjoy all the fun there and enjoy worshiping together. Um, and a great opportunity to invite folks, maybe folks that wouldn't come into the church building, but they're going to come out to the fair. So uh, get a, an opportunity to spend a little time with Jesus and an opportunity opportunity to enjoy some good wholesome fun uh, thank you again for everybody who supported the birthright effort with the baby bottles that is still continuing if you didn't bring your bottle in if you're still collecting change or you want to grab another one you're more than welcome to they collected over 527 dollars from our donations already wow. yeah that's awesome we have a wonderful generous uh, group here and again for such a great cause to help um, women with unexpected pregnancies that find themselves in that situation what a great uh, a great mission and a great heart that they have so please uh, feel free to continue to bring those in. You can drop them at the Welcome Center um, as you accumulate yours there. And this week is the Faith-Based Cancer Support Group um, on the 10th. So again, if you know someone in that situation or someone that's a caregiver, a great opportunity to support each other and encourage each other um, through God's Word um, on Wednesday evenings. I think that's it. The rest is in there. You can uh, take a peek. We want to thank you for being here this morning, and we're going to continue yes, worshiping God. Yes, we are. 
where he is uh, is leading us and uh, I'm kind of excited about what's going on this summer because um, um, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for for us to really be part of what uh, I think is gonna be just some awesome stuff that God is gonna lead us into so um, the only thing I can say is hold on <laughs> Because lots of fun is going to happen this summer, and we're going to get a lot of opportunity to uh, hopefully share the gospel with a lot of people. And uh, just like I said, don't let go and hold on and strap in. It's a good thing that we have a God that never lets go of us.
give that right up to God because that's where it belongs. Absolutely. You know, when I, uh, uh, when I was going through this week and I was looking at um, all the things that are going on, not only here at LifeBridge, but all throughout the community and, and, and all, um, I realized something uh, that just kind of struck me, that God, God is constantly at work. If we'll just open our eyes and open our hearts and really look to see what it is he is doing in and around us. He is constantly at work. And whether I'm seeing it, I know he is there. And I don't know about you, I want to be part of his plan.
Lake and Porter County food pantries. And we feed people. <laughs> <laughs> How, how do we do that? So what are you doing? You're standing out here in front of the store. I'm standing out here and I'm handing out these little flyers that tell people the foods that we're looking for. Let me see the flyer. So this is the flyer. So it says, help us help the hungry, feed the need today from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. A town and country in Valparaiso and Portage. So they can purchase anything on the list. Mm -hmm. And then we get a whole bunch of miscellaneous stuff too. And it tells all about it. Mm -hmm. and when I say, Hi, today we're accepting donations for the North Indiana Food Bank. It's issued them on the Lake and Porter County Food Bank. These are the big five couple items and talk about a layout. Um, God does amazing things here in and through the people of Life Bridge Christian Church. He really does. Uh, I, I regularly have conversations with other pastors, other church planters, um, people from other places around the country where when we talk about what is happening, what God is doing here, and I, I don't embellish. I just talk about the programs that we are involved in and the things that, 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 uh, that happen here at LifeBridge um, in and through the people here. And I describe the numbers, and so I tell them about things like feeding 500 families at, at Thanksgiving and uh, that has now become 900 families, and the goal next year will be 1,000 families. And I tell them about, you know, a giraffe and a half of, uh, of, uh, in, in weight of food that goes to the Northwest Indiana Food Bank and how uh, that ends up being uh, uh, their number one food drive of the year uh, for bringing that in. Prior to doing that with the, the Northwest Indiana F Food Bank, we, we helped the homeless shelter uh, that was in the area, and that homeless shelter doesn't exist anymore, and so uh, that has changed, and the churches have band together to become the homeless shelter for the men and for uh, the women as well, and so we participate in that way uh, to the extent that we can, uh, and, and so we have people here on Thursday nights and going into Friday morning that stay here through the summer, and um, we use up all of our nights that we're allowed to use up because we're not an official shelter um, we are a church. There's, there's certain limitations on how many nights a year we're allowed to have people stay overnight here. And, and we fill up all of those nights. We, we use our limitation there. We, uh, uh, we are involved in so many things. And, and whether you realize it or not, whether you see it or not, because if you know of programs like 500 Turkeys, and if you know of things like Feed the Need and so forth, you understand that we're not the ones that are giving all the food, we're not the ones giving all the money, we're not the ones that are pulling all that stuff together. But this church body, LifeBridge Christian Church, the people who are here, uh, are the catalyst for those ministries, provide the leadership for those ministries, draw people together from other churches and from other communities for, for all kinds of ministries that are happening around in our community. And when you look at that, if you actually back up and look at the numbers, it can become uh, kind of overwhelming to, to recognize. Because on any given Sunday, we have between 150 to 200 people here at LifeBridge Christian Church. Uh, the number of people that we have that would consider this their church home is somewhere in the ballpark of 400 people. And so the average people on a, on a Sunday versus, you know, the number of people that consider it their church home, that's kind of normal for, for a church. Uh, people on average will come about every other week um, for various reasons. There's all kinds of stuff going on in our lives and so forth. But uh, so consistent church attendance anymore across the country 
has become every other week rather than every week uh, church attendance for, for, the, for the worship services. I share all this, we're going to get into some numbers today, and it seems, uh, um, I don't want you to get bored with numbers. I, I want you to see God through the numbers as I share some of those things with you. Because we have, you know, 400 people that say LifeBridge is their church home, which equates to somewhere around 100 families that consider LifeBridge their church home. And yet, we are a part of, we are a catalyst that, is, that fed 900 families for Thanksgiving. How in the world does that happen? And every time somebody outside of this area hears about that, they end up going, how in the world do you guys do that? And my response is always the same. We don't. God does. But we have a group of people that really wants God to work in their lives. And really want to allow God to work through their lives. And because of that, the church body continues to become more and more of a healthy body. And caring about uh, living out that, what we call that garden walk. Walking together with God. And we don't just make that inward focus where it's our walk and our life and our relationship with God, but we recognize that it is important that we let that flow over into the lives that we are connected to. And so we empower one more to walk together with God. When God's Spirit is at work, what happens around God's people and through God's people and in God's people is far bigger than anything we can do ourselves. You see it every time. When God's Spirit is, is at work, what happens in and through God's people is far bigger than anything that they could do by themselves. That's how God works. God does it that way so that people will see God through those actions. You see, when we go out and we feed the hungry, when we go out and do a, a, a food bank uh, when we do a food drive for the Northwest Indiana food, food Bank, or we try to help out with the local homeless shelter, or we feed families at Thanksgiving, or any of the other ministries that we do, when we help the, the, the ladies, the battered women's shelter, when we, I mean, the, the, when we, the ministries that just kind of go through my head that we are involved in and the catalyst for here at LifeBridge, when we do those things, we know that what we're doing is, is glorifying God. We're helping people to see God. We're being the light of the world. We're not just doing a food program. We are proclaiming Christ crucified. We are helping people to see what a difference it makes when God is in your life. And because of that, not only is God glorified, but people are drawn to God. And people grow up into Christ, who is the head as a result of all these ministries that God has us involved in and doing. It can be overwhelming. You can feel like we're out of control. But I'll tell you, uh, there are times as we go through and we do these ministries that we, we, uh, we feel like we want to we grab control of them. Just when it gets to the point where it's like going out of control, it's like we want to grab control. We want to organize it. We want to have the, the committee and the team and the, and the budget and everything laid out so that we know that everything is going gonna, is gonna to be okay. But, but what I want to tell you today is that it is only when we get to that point where it is feeling out of control and we recognize we can't grab control that that is where God is shown the most. That is where the Spirit is flowing. That is the place where it just, it, you just have to stop and watch in awe of what is happening. And that, oh by the way, that will put us in good company. Because we're, when, we're, when we're in that place where it is completely out of our control, and we recognize that it has to be in God's control in order for this thing to work in unity together, well, then we're just like the first church. We're like the church that began on the day of Pentecost because there was nothing about that day that was under their control. There was nothing about the, the, the church in Acts chapter 2 
in Acts chapter 3 and all the way through the rest of the book of Acts. There's nothing about that church that is under their control. They didn't, they didn't bring the Holy Spirit of God down on the day of Pentecost and in the form of a fire above their heads. They didn't give themselves the ability to, to, to speak in different languages. They didn't bring... Peter got up and preached a great sermon that day. And I, I thank God for Peter, and I don't know what language he spoke in that day because they said he was, they were all speaking in tongues, so maybe he spoke in his native language, maybe he was speaking in a different language. I don't know what he was speaking in that day. But Peter gets up and gives a sermon, and he does something that, that every evangelist, every preacher wishes they could do. He got up and he preached the sermon, and it says 3,000 people were added to their numbers that day. Was that Peter? No, not at all. That was the unleashing power of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Because this series is about the Holy Spirit. And while when we studied last year, during the summer, we studied Jesus, Jesus is kind of um, controllable, if you will. Jesus was, came down... God came down in the form of flesh, which we can wrap our minds around. Jesus became like one of us. And so we feel close to Jesus. We become friends with Jesus. We'll call Jesus our brother. We'll call Jesus our friend. We'll call Jesus our Savior and our Lord because of the specific ministry that Jesus did in dying and going to the cross and dying and rising again on the third day. And when He rose on the third day, it, it showed us that Jesus was not able to be controlled. When Jesus won against Satan in the 40 days in the wilderness, it showed us that Jesus couldn't be controlled. But still, we can wrap our minds around Jesus because He was a person. He was in, in flesh. He was like one of us in every way. Even tempted like one of us, but without sin. So, so Jesus is easier to get our minds around. But the Holy Spirit, every time the Holy Spirit shows up on the scene, it gets uncontrollable. Every time the Holy Spirit shows up on the scene, it gets un out of control, at least out of our control. And it starts showing God's control, God's power, God working in and through God's people. Take, take a look at this example. This is after they prayed. So they get together, the, the, and, and this is Acts chapter 4. So the Holy Spirit has already come, they already preached, they already had 3,000 added to their numbers at this point. Okay, the church is starting to grow. After they prayed, it says, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They prayed, the Holy Spirit showed up, there were no fiery tongues at this point. At this point, it was an earthquake. You ever feel like you're out of control? Uh, you would definitely feel like if you were, you were out of control if you were in the midst of an earthquake, if you ever lived through an earthquake or a large earthquake or even a smaller one. You just kind of stop because every, everything is rumbling and, you're, and, and now you're trying to figure out where can I go in the midst of this that will be safe because I do not have control over the circumstances. I do not have control over the situation. I do not have control over whether some things are going to start falling around me or not. Earthquakes remind us that we are just, you know, these, this puny little piece of this really big thing called the world. And so they had an earthquake. The place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God boldly. And all the believers were one in heart and mind. And they claimed that no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. They shared everything that they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land and houses sold them. They brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as they had need. The Holy Spirit came and the church changed. Even the economic system changed. Even the way they approached where they were going to get food to eat and have uh, clothing to wear and have a place to sleep, it all changed. Everything about their life changed when the Holy Spirit was unleashed. Well, before we get too crazy here, I'm going to give you a chance to just uh, share the Holy Spirit with somebody else today. Would you get up and greet somebody this morning and tell them that you're glad that, you're he that they're here? 
and uh, let, the, let the Spirit flow through you to encourage somebody today. Let's go ahead and do that right now. Let's come back to our seats. Pat, and then they got the truck going on down there. Yep. Kind of stops. Is somebody working the truck besides Jenny? No. No? Okay. We had a lot more people this morning. It's my fault. Here you go. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm learning about feed the need. How's it going today? It's going very well. We have beautiful weather and plenty of volunteers and lots of customers willing to give. I'm not so willing, but most willing. So we're filling up a truck down there? Uh, so far so good, and I hear Portage is doing phenomenal. So much better than previous years, and they have collected more cash donations than they normally do. So they're surpassing us in food collection and cash donations this year. They're beating Valpo? They are beating Valpo. Nice. Yes, they're doing a great job. That's a first. It is a first. Yeah. But it's their turn. Yeah. So that's fine. We'll blame the good weather. Yes. That's what it was. And all the open houses in Valpo today. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, they're going on everywhere. Can I come look at the truck? Yeah, please do. All right. It, it causes people to pause for a moment when they see people who are giving generously. And when I say giving generously, I, I, I mean financially, I mean uh, with their time and with their energy. When, when we stand out front in front of a store and we hand out flyers and, and, and ask people to uh, look at things on the list, it's easy as one, two, three, look at the items on the list and you can purchase one or more of them and bring it back and put it in the basket, we'll take care of delivering it. You know, when, when, when we do that, w one of the things that happens is that that people are impacted by the person standing there just handing them a flyer because you're giving of your time. Because, because you're choosing to make that something that's important that day. And because you're choosing to make something, that something that's important that day, people pause. They, they, they go, wow. You know, uh, they must, they'll use phrases like, they must really believe that. Right? They must really believe that. We'll use that phrase. That must be important to them. That's really neat that they, uh, that they, that they do that. And it gets them thinking. What's important to me? What do I believe? What, what, what will I spend an hour or two hours or three hours or all day long doing? What, what, what kinds of things do I... Um, lay out on my calendar and on my task list and, and in my life. T today, I, we're talking about a, a topic that um, usually isn't tied together with and associated with the Holy Spirit, but it is here when I teach because everything that I'm teaching and preaching comes straight from, from Scripture, from God's Word. And... Uh, and I know it's an area that has caused confusion over the years as, as people have come to LifeBridge and try to figure out, maybe they have a previous church experience where they've heard preaching and teaching on the topic, and then they try to come here and they try to assimilate those into the, to the extent that it matches with what they've heard, then, then they feel good. Okay, this is okay, this is a good church because Pete's teaching the right stuff because it's what I, ha I heard at my other church. Okay. Or if I didn't like it at my other church, then, then, okay, Pete teaches something different on this, and so then I feel good about this church because they don't teach what they, what they taught at my other church. But, but today what we're going to be talking about is, uh, it, it's at the top of your paper, it says giving. But what you really should be writing next to it is, is right in front of the, the word spirit-led. So spirit-led giving is what we're talking about today. Because what you will find in the Old Testament and in the New 
is that giving is not about money. Giving is not about meeting budgets. Giving is, is not about feeling guilty. <laughs> uh, giving is not about paying a NIPSCO bill. Giving in the church is always about following the Holy Spirit of God. Doing what the Spirit is calling us to do. Which is why every week when we're here at LifeBridge and we get to a time of giving, which we have, we have a time of offering as a part of our service so that people can participate in the ministry here at LifeBridge. And I always say that you never need to feel pressured to give, at least not by me or anybody here at LifeBridge, that God will tell you, God will make it clear to you if you're supposed to give, and if so, how much. I say that not because of any other reason other than the fact that that's what Scripture teaches. That's what we find in the Bible. That is that all of this is driven by God, by the Holy Spirit of God. And so because of it, we're going to be talking about it today in the context of the Holy Spirit. It's not about how much money that you give. In fact, if anything, it seems to be tied to a, a heart thing and a percentage thing. Jesus, when he looked up and he saw the rich uh, putting their gifts into the temple treasury, he also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Now, before I go too much further with this, here, here's how the temple treasury thing worked. Okay, In Israel, at this point, there were 12 tribes of Israel that went along with the 12 boys that... Uh, that uh, Jacob, who got renamed Israel, he had 12 boys. And, and one of those tribes, Levi, one of those groups of people and descendants, Levi, was set apart by God in Israel to do God's work specifically. They became the priests. They were the ones that took care of the, the, the tent, which was the tabernacle, when they would set up the tent and, and take it back down, the place where they would meet God. When they were nomads and they were wandering around this tent, this tabernacle would get set up in the middle of the, the camp. And all of that set up, tear down, taking care of it, taking care of the Ark of the Covenant, all that stuff was, was uh, the responsibility of the tribe of Levi. That was their job. That was their focus. Okay? So what, what they did was God set it up and said, all the other 11 tribes, this is their job and their focus, so I don't want them farming. I don't want them out there uh, taking care of the cattle. I don't want them to be shepherds and sheep herders and so forth. You guys are taking care of all of that. You're doing all that stuff. They're focusing on this stuff. So you take a tenth of what you have, you bring it into here, and that will pay for and take care of them. Okay, That was the, the tithe. A tithe is 10%. And, and the 10% of those 11 tribes supported the 12th tribe, Levi, and people would bring it in as an act of worship, giving that first tenth. They would take the first tenth of their crops when they would go and they would harvest the crops. They bring in the first tenth, and that first tenth was to take care of this tribe that was doing God's work. All the sacrifices, the priests, the things that they did, all of that was being supported by those tithes, by that 10%. And so it was kind of an economic system that was set up. Now, in addition to that economic system, there was, a, a, there was an act of worship that was happening there. So they would take the best of what they had and bring it in before God. They would take their first fruits, the first part of their crops, and bring it in before God. And, and that was the tithing that they, that they did. And when the Levites received that, that uh, giving, those tithes, for them to live off of, they also had to do an act of worship. They were told to take a tithe of those tithes, 10% of what came in. They were to take it and take it over and burn it up on the altar as a reminder that all of it, 100% of it, really belonged to God and that their very life, their livelihood, was dependent upon God. It kept everybody in that same place, the entire people of Israel as a reminder. Now, I, 
that's, that's an important context to, for, for uh, giving and understanding because a lot of times churches today will talk about tithing. Uh, and the pastors will preach on that and tell you that you need to tithe, and you need to tithe, and you need to tithe, and you need to tithe. And, and I end up preaching and teaching, if you, you've been around when I've taught on this before, that that's actually an Old Testament concept. Um, that was something that was specific to Israel. And then people will ask, well, how much am I supposed to give then today? And, I, and I, my answer is, whatever the Spirit leads you to do. Okay? And, and they feel like it's a cop-out, but it's not a cop-out. What I'm trying to do is to get you to walk together with God. Our mission at LifeBridge Christian Church is to empower one more to walk together with God. What I want for your life is for you to do everything in every area of your life that God calls you to do. I want to help you to recognize that. I want to help you to, to, to know when God is calling you to take a step, to do something, to help somebody, to make a phone call, to pray for them, to read God's Word. I want to help you to recognize when God is leading so that you will follow in all circumstances, in all situations, because that's what it looks like to walk together with God. And we know that because Jesus gave us the mission to go and make disciples of all nations, that a part of that walk together with God is not just thinking of ourselves, but going one step further and empowering one more. So you might go to another church and they teach you to tithe, or they tell you you're supposed to give 10% of your income, and then you come here and Pete doesn't say that, and it just messes with your mind. Jesus, when he was at the temple and he's looking at people coming in and they're bringing in uh, temple taxes and they're bringing in tithes and so forth, Jesus starts to mess with the minds of his apostles. Because, because quite honestly, you know, as, as somebody who ends up living off of that, it becomes a very awkward position for all of us. Preachers, teachers, I would imagine back then for the priests and the rabbis and the you know, the, the Levites that were living off of those tithes. You are reminded every day, every week, every moment of your life that you are totally dependent upon God and God's people for you to eat. It's a constant reminder of that. So when, when, when there's a good week of giving and people bring in a whole bunch of money, then you're praising God and great we get to eat this week and there's another time that you know there's not good giving and people don't bring in money that week and and you're sitting there saying okay God um, you know I'm, I'm trusting you that we'll have groceries this week uh, and so you know it's it's an up and down it's a constant situation so what ends up happening is at least in Jesus's day the teachers would talk about it a lot Keep reminding them, hey, don't forget to bring in your tithe, don't forget to bring in your tithe, don't forget to bring in your tithe. The other thing that would happen is that they would pay attention more to people who were wealthier because when they brought in their tithe, that had a greater impact than somebody who was not wealthy and they brought in their tithe. Jesus messes with her mind this day because a widow comes in and she puts in two small copper coins. It's like putting two pennies in the offering basket. And he says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of the others. All of these gave, um, all of these gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she gave out of her poverty and put in all that she had to live on wasn't about the dollar amount. It's recognizing the heart of the person. And it's kind of a percentage thing, that she was giving a greater percentage of what she had to be able to offer. Paul ends up writing to the church in Corinth because they're going to help out another church who is not as wealthy. And, uh, and they're going to save up money so that they can help this poorer church out. And... Uh, as he's writing to me, he says, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem, for I know how eager you are to help. I've been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you and Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. I'm sending these brothers to be sure that you're really ready. And I've been telling them about your money that you've collected. 
uh, I don't want to be wrong about my boasting about you, uh, so we would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some of the Macedonian believers came with me and they found out you really weren't giving, um, like you said you were going to. So I thought I, I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift that, uh, that you promised is ready. But, he says, I want it to be a willing gift, not one that is giving grudgingly. Over in the old building, uh, we, uh, we used to have a, a thing under the slot where you could, you could give money um, back at the Welcome Center. There's a slot at this Welcome Center in case you know, some, you know, somebody misses you when, you when we do the offering bag and so forth, or if you want to turn a Connect card after the fact. And uh, so there's a slot over there with a, with a lockbox thing. And um, uh, we used to have written on the floor, because it was a concrete floor and it was a messier building than, than what we, even than this one is. Uh, and on the floor, um, it, it said, uh, Raffle, R-O-F-L, roll, roll on the floor laughing. It, this, this statement here, uh, I want it to be a willing gift, not, not grudgingly, for God loves a cheerful giver, is the next statement. And, and that statement literally means a hilarious giver. It's like you're laughing so hard because of the joy that is coming from giving. Giving should be something that we do willingly, not because somebody twists our arm. And so the first thing that we should recognize about spirit-led giving is that it will be prompted from within, prompted from the Spirit, and it will bring joy to us when we do it. It is not going to be because of a guilt trip. It's not going to be because somebody twists their arm. It's not going to be because, uh, because I get up and I you know, say X, Y, Z. It's not going to be because we make a list of how much money you're supposed to give and then start calling you and giving you a hard time because you didn't give the amount of money that you were supposed to give or that you committed to. It's not going to be because we figure out what your income is and tell you you have to tithe. None of those things, none of those things are, are, are true of New Testament giving. It's always a willing thing that is prompted by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, uh, whom the apostles called Barnabas, means son of encouragement, sold a field that he owned, and he brought money and put it at the apostles' feet. See, now how much was that field worth? We don't know. How, how much was that out of his total income and holdings? We have no clue. See, what we start seeing in the New Testament is people doing overwhelmingly generous things that are above and beyond a, a tithe or a 10% in order for the ministry to take place, to keep going. What's happening is that they are seeing God at work and they want God to keep working there. And so if that means making sure that this widow is taken care of or making sure that this preacher or teacher has food to eat or a place to live or whatever the case may be, they, they're, whatever is, will keep this going. That's what they want to do. And so they give to those purposes. So they find out that, hey, we need X amount of money. And so they go and somebody goes and sells some land and say, hey, I got some land. You know, well, we don't need land right now. Okay, well, we need cash. Well, I'll sell the land, and he sells the land, brings it in, and, and gives the land. People give all kinds of things. And, and I've, been, I've, I've experienced, <laughs> experienced that over the years. Um, it's something that I really wasn't aware of or, and didn't expect when I first came here to LifeBridge. But people give all kinds of things. We had somebody donate one time uh, um, uh, cemetery plots. Because that's, they, that's what they had to give. And they had these cemetery plots that, that things worked out that they weren't going to need them. And it, it was a family thing and passed down to them. And they said, you know, can the, can the church use these? And we were like, I, I don't know. But it's, I mean, they, they signed the paperwork and it's on our books. We have these cemetery, I don't know if it's one or two of them, we got these cemetery plots so that, that people donate because that's what they had to give. And they, they, they saw what God was doing here. And they said, I want to help out. With, with what I have to give. Sometimes people do it with their time. You know, I don't have any money, but I have time. Where can I help out? Where can I dig in? I want to help with this ministry. I want to be involved in this. Some, sometimes they, don't, they, they can't cash it out, but they, they bring something. And so they give 
gifts, uh, at times with, with 500 turkeys. Those gifts came in in the form of uh, uh, things that got auctioned off. And then the auction money got used to buy the food in order to... And so the ministers take care of kind of converting that, if you will, from a painting to money to feeding the hungry. And so the ministry is, is taking care of those kinds of things. People give all kinds of things, whatever it is that they have, and they see God at work here, and they want to participate, and so they do. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven, Jesus said. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, or to be honored by other people. Truly, I tell you that you receive their reward in, in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, and so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. The second thing that I see as a principle with spirit-led giving is that, that we're usually led to give secretly. We're not looking for fanfare. We're not looking for people to, to, to say, oh, look at me, I'm all that. We're, we're, not, we're not asking for... Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't have anything against it. There's nothing non-biblical, I guess, about it other than it starts to clash with this particular scripture. But, but uh, you ever seen building programs where, where, where people want their name on a plaque, you know? And so we have bricks with names on it and so forth. If you give this level, you get a brick. If you do this level, you got a plaque over here. If you do this, you get a whole wing dedicated to your name. Okay? Well, I, I start to struggle at times when we're talking about giving in different areas. And this is one of those places where I start to struggle. And it's because of this scripture. I'm, I'm here to empower you to walk together with God. I'm supposed to be helping you to follow what Jesus says. And one of the things Jesus said was, don't make big fanfare about your giving. Um, so, you know, when I go to the store and they say, will you give X, you know, will you give money to this particular cause? First of all, I check out what the cause is. And if it's something that I'll, I'll, I'll back, then I'll, I'll give money to it. And a lot of times they'll have that, you know, the shoe there and we'll put your name on it and so forth. Uh, or, or whatever the case may be, and, and uh, they'll have a, a balloon and put your name on it, or whatever the, you know, the thing is, and they'll say, well, what's your name? I'll put it on here. And I, and I, I tell them, um, no, I don't need one. That's okay. Well, I'll put, your, I'll put your name on it. Okay, put Jesus on there. Or put your name on there. You're the one that, that gave me the opportunity. Put your name on there. Give secretly. Give because God is prompting you to give with no other expectations other than, I followed God today. I did what God was calling me to do today. And feel the joy that comes from doing what God called you to do that day. The Spirit will give you joy as a result of that. You give willingly, we give secretly. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much you must give, and don't give reluctantly or response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. That's the hilarious giver one, by the way. God loves a person who gives, uh, in Greek, hilariously, cheerfully. And God will generously provide all that you need, I love this. God will generously provide all that you need, and you will always have everything that you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. When we are a cheerful giver, we'll always have food to eat. That's what it tells me. It doesn't tell me I'll get wealthy. It, it, it does tell me that God will start entrusting more funds into my care because the funds are flowing through me to the stuff God wants done. Okay? So the more I give to what God wants done, and the more I'm in tune with the Holy Spirit, what it says is that God will start entrusting more into my care to flow through to what God wants done. Because I'm not going to hold on to it for my own stuff. And, and I've shown that with my actions. And so God will start entrusting more into my care to flow through to what God wants done. And I've seen this very, very much 
uh, very true in my own life as well, that that's how God works. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. So we had Barnabas sold a piece of property, and we also have Ananias. And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. He brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money that you received for the land? Now, I'm going to pause right there. As a preacher and teacher, I'm not sure that that's a strategy that I necessarily would take with people. Okay? If you went off and you sold a piece of property for $100,000 and you came in and you brought, say, $70,000 to the church and you kept $30,000 for yourself, I'm not sure that I'd look you in the eye and the first thing that I would say is, how is it that you let Satan fill your heart so much? Yet clearly, that is what God told Peter to say. I'm just sharing that with you because there are times as a preacher that I'm really not saying what I want to say. I'm, <laughs> I'm saying what God word, God's Word says. I'm saying what the Holy Spirit prompts me to say. And uh, it is not because I don't love all of you. It is because I have to love God first and be obedient to what He calls me to say. Anyway, <laughs> how is it that Satan, you listen to Satan, he says. He filled your heart so much that you lied to the Holy Spirit, you kept for yourself some of the money that you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? So what made you think of doing such a thing? What's Peter getting at, getting at here? It is not that Ananias held back, say, $30,000 for himself. It's that he came in expecting fanfare and saying, look, I sold the property for $70,000. And he didn't. He sold it for 100 He lied. And he lied so that he would look good in front of everybody. He lied because somebody else sold their property and brought in all of the money and he was jealous of that somebody else. He lied for whatever reason he decided to lie, but he lied about it. And because he lied about it, it's going to cost him. You've not just lied to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and he died. And great fear seized all who heard what was happening. The most important thing about giving is that we give as the Spirit leads. That's why I say what I say every week. We need to give as the Spirit leads. That's what should be driving every single one of us. That's how it will work. I know I'm, gonna, I'm running over here. But what I'm going to do is share something with you, and I'm just going to keep it quick, that may, um, I'm just going to share it with you. I've known since before we moved to Valparaiso, Indiana, that God was not calling me and Tracy to only reach out to the people in Valparaiso and Porter County and the surrounding areas. I've known that for 12 years now. The Spirit was very clear. God's Word was very clear. And I knew with what God was bringing to the table with me that God was calling me to a ministry that was going to be uh, different than that and would be reaching out purposefully to more people than we even have living in the area. We have a little over 30,000 people living in Valparaiso, Indiana. We've got 167,000 people roughly living in Porter County. And, um, and our mission statement here at LifeBridge is to empower one more to walk together with God. But since before day one, the mission that God has placed, placed on my heart is to reach one million people 
and empower one million people to walk together with God. Now I say that hoping that you won't laugh <laughs> uh, or uh, get up and leave as I share that. Because I'm convinced that God is calling this church to be the hub for that ministry. For us to become the team that reaches out and empowers one million people to walk together with God. Now there's a lot to that. And that vision has been being built over the last 12 years. And there are many components that we have already kind of put in place and started to, have to do here at LifeBridge. And there are other components that we will still need to do and work together as a team to accomplish those things. Way back when we started LifeBridge, I wrote a newsletter that went out to people who were mission-minded members of the body of Christ. Because LifeBridge didn't exist yet. That newsletter was called Blueprints. And Blueprints was written so that I could communicate with people who cared about the mission of empowering people to walk together with God up here in Valparaiso, Indiana, and then reaching out from this place as a, as a hub. We had 200 people who were committed to be prayer partners uh, for this ministry as we got started. And there were many people who joined up to be financial partners as well. Blueprints changed as we started LifeBridge and started to become kind of a newsletter of what was happening at LifeBridge. But I, I lost the opportunity really to speak directly to the mission-minded members of the body of Christ who cared about this empowering one more, but they were, um, they were not here as a part of the body. We now have a newsletter called God Sightings, and God Sightings is our opportunity to talk about what's going on in, in the church body, and we have that come out every week electronically and sent out via mail, uh, via email. And uh, we do that mostly because of, of cost in terms of time and finances. It is much more nimble, it's much quicker, it's much easier to go ahead and write those articles and get the information to you quickly, as opposed to all the stuff that goes along with a paper newsletter to get it into somebody's home. What I'm going to do starting this week is I'm going to bring back blueprints. Blueprints will be specifically for mission-minded people, mission-minded members of the body of Christ, not just members of LifeBridge, but members of the body of Christ, who wants to know what it is that God is doing here and where God is leading us and taking us next. It'll be for vision casting and for sharing that information with you so that you can see and I'm going to be openly talking about this mission to empower one million people to walk together with God. I would love for you to sign up for that and receive that via email. If you would like that, you can take your Connect card and you can write on anywhere on your Connect card, just write blueprints, and I will put your email on the list. And each Saturday, you will get the compilation of articles from that week that go along with this mission of empowering one million people to walk together with God. In addition to that, we're going to be making a change uh, to our giving starting this week. And I'm looking for my program, and I don't know what I did with it. Oh, well. Somewhere in this book is my stuff. Here it is. For a while, we've had uh, green envelopes. And green envelopes have had different meaning over the years. Usually it had to do with a building or a land campaign. We're trying to purchase the land down on Route 2, and so it, if you gave with a green envelope, it would go specifically to the land. Now we've refinanced things, and so uh, that green envelope money is helping with uh, setting up that financing because there are still some conditions that we have to, to meet. We have to put some money uh, in a savings account. We have to have three months worth of mortgage payments sitting in a savings account with them at Solomon Foundation. And so the green envelope money is going toward that so that we can uh, meet that uh, loan requirement for, for the land. But what we're going to do starting this week is we're going to change the meaning of the green envelope. LifeRidge now, uh, as of today, has a ministry called Garden Walk Ministries. And Garden Walk's focus will be to empower one million people to walk together with God. 
The whole purpose of that ministry is just to focus on, on that, the specific things that are necessary to start reaching out from here to a further audience and empowering more and more people uh, to walk together with God. If you give to the green envelope, that'll be a designated giving to that particular ministry, to Garden Walk Ministries. Uh, you've seen pieces of what we're going to be doing by those of you who came through the series with the, the green books, the Garden Walk books. It's going to be very purposeful about reaching people and moving them through a path uh, one after another, tracking that, recognizing when it is uh, happening, and also seeing the roadblocks to it happening so that we can be prayerfully working through those things with God and overcoming those roadblocks. I really hope that as uh, you hear this and that you pray about it, that you will be uh, encouraged and excited to be a part of a bigger ministry that is going to be reaching out beyond the walls of this building, this city, and this county, that we will be a part of a bigger picture, God's bigger plan, to empower one more and walk together with God. God is the one who provides the seed for the farmer and bread to eat. And in the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and produce a great harvest of generous generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when you take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. When we do spirit-led giving, it always gives glory to God. And that's what we're going to do right now. If you'd like to give financially, this is the time to participate in our time of offering. Uh, whether you're giving a, a percentage, like a tithe or uh, an offering or uh, some other kind of an amount. Um, let God lead you in that. Give cheerfully. Give secretly. Um, give to the glory of God. You can always take that Connect card that you filled out, fold it up and put it in the offering bag as it comes around as an act of worship. If you have a prayer request on that Connect card, turn that over to God and trust Him. Let's go ahead and give our gifts at this time. Pat's first time. Pat's helping first time helping needs. with feed the need. I know you don't like the camera. <laughs> Thanks. Have a wonderful weekend. Yeah, Pat doesn't like the camera. So my son just pulled out his change jar and was filling up a baby bottle back at our house. <laughs> so, so you're not just about baby bottles, you're about feeding the hungry too, huh? You're about volunteering. <laughs> yeah, it is. We got a lot of them at LifeBridge. <laughs> Professional volunteer. Yep, I like that. I liked that term that she said, a professional volunteer. I found it interesting, too, that um, the three that were on the videos there, uh, Lily was saying, put the camera away. I don't like cameras. Uh, Pat immediately said, you know, I, I don't like cameras. And uh, uh, Jenny lets me share the story, but I, I still remember the, the day she was sitting in my living room, and she says, I don't pray out loud. That's not going to happen. <laughs> We, um, 
Amazing things happen when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us. None of those three ladies give um, because they, uh, they want credit or glory. They, they serve, they give because they are led by God to serve and to give. And so they are obedient. Um, with, with Anna, we used to coin the phrase serveaholic. Uh, I, I like Pat's phrase better. Um, she, uh, she says, I'm a professional volunteer. They serve because God is calling them to serve. It all comes down to being obedient, being in sync with the Holy Spirit of God. And I'll tell you, no one can go up against God and win. So it really is much better just to do what God is calling you to do. Some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, who's Ananias' body, carried him out and buried him, and about three hours later his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, <laughs> Oh, and this is the point in the story where I'm, I'm ready to yell, don't do it. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said. That's the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband at the door and they will carry you out also. And at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. And the young men came in, finding her dead. They carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. God tells us that the wages of sin is death. And sin is Nothing more than rebellion against God. And make no mistake, folks, God's Spirit, that's God. If God's been prompting you, God's Spirit has been trying to put, push you, trying to get you to do something, pray for someone, get involved in a ministry, give. And you've been fighting it. I'd like to offer you this time of communion to, to turn back to God. As we take the bread and the cup, we remember that God came here in the form of Jesus, the flesh. He dwelt among us. He was humble and obedient to the Father, even to death on the cross. He laid down his life so that you and I might live. I'm so glad that he, he listened to and followed the Holy Spirit of God. Because if he hadn't, you and I would not have a way home to the Father. But now we do, through the Son. So take communion. When it comes around, you just take the bread and the cup and, and take it at your own pace, your own leisure. Pass the tray to the next person. And as you take the the communion, take the time to remember how much God loves you, the extent that He wants you to bring you home. And take the time to ask God to lead you through His Spirit. Okay, God, what do you want me to do next? Let's go ahead and take communion now.
the Holy Spirit it gets out of control <laughs> at least out of ours the apostles por- performed many signs and wonders among the people and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade no one else dared to join them even though they were highly regarded uh, by the people and then it says this nevertheless more and more men and women believed in the Lord And they were added to their number. Paul said, as a result of your ministry, 
they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all the believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace that God has given you. Thank God for this gift too. We're wonderful, too wonderful for words. As you go from here, walk by the Spirit. Know that you are not alone. Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. As you go from here, go with His Spirit, leading you, prompting you. Listen to the Spirit. Follow the Spirit. Participate with the Spirit. Give generously, quietly, as the Spirit prompts you. Let God's light work in you and shine through you. Let's go from here, giving glory to God. Yes, I can see a light that's coming from the heart that holds on. There'll be an end to these struggles, but until that day comes, Lord, still I will praise you.